afternoon, everyone. I'm Noble Maseru, uh, director for the Center uh, for Health Equity, and um, I'm pleased to uh, uh, share with you the opportunity of a double treat. The double treat, number one, is the exhibit that hopefully some of you have seen, and perhaps if you haven't, uh, we'll do so momentarily after, uh, after the, uh, our lecture. But the other treat is, is that one of the creators of the exhibit, a Legacy of Black Medical Schools and Departments in the United States, 1868 uh, to 1968, uh, Dr. Anita Moncrease uh, will be uh, providing the lecture. So I want to, before we uh, introduce Dr. Moncrease, I want to uh, thank our our co-sponsors. Um, our co-sponsors are uh, Ms. Paula Davis and Mr. Mario Brown uh, with the Office of uh, Health Sciences and, and Diversity, uh, Pam Connolly with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and uh, Doris Rubio, uh, Leeds Fellowship in Translational Research. Also, uh, would like to uh, extend uh, our thanks to um, Ms. Julia Dom of the library here. Uh, Julia uh, was instrumental uh, from day one in having uh, the exhibit uh, put together. Uh, so thank you, uh, Ms. Dom. I would also be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge our folks and our staff, uh, Chantel Durant and Ms. Laura Ann Bray. So thank you. Uh, so we put this uh, exhibit at least we brought it here uh, in April uh, for two reasons. One, uh, the first week in April is uh, National Public Health uh, Week. Uh, secondly, the month of April is uh, Minority Health Month. And for uh, some of you, you may uh, know how that more or less uh, National uh, uh, Minority Health Month, how that evolved. It actually came out of uh, starting uh, the 1986 uh, from the uh, Heckler Report, the Minority Health Report in 1986. But prior to that, uh, 1915, uh, Booker T. Washington uh, launched something called uh, Health Improvement Week, uh, which evolved into the National Negro Health Week and then into the National Negro Health Movement. Now, Booker T. Uh, his thing uh, was uh, recognizing the importance of health, what it meant in terms of economic development and progress for the race, specifically African American people. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, also had a, a similar uh, recognition of the importance of uh, health and what it meant in terms of uh, economic uh, progress uh, for African American people. Uh, now, uh, Booker T. Washington also had what he called uh, a slogan of hand, help, and hand, heart, and head. Hand, heart, and head. So the heart is compassion. The hand is essentially skills, dexterity, and of course, uh, the head meaning in terms of your mind, the uh, importance of, of health. So um, the two associations in 1900, uh, two associations uh, existed at the turn of the century. One was the American Medical Association, the other the National Medical Association. The National Medical Association uh, was uh, almost uh, exclusively uh, of African American persons. The American Medical Association was exclusively of uh, Caucasians. Um, the AMA was established in 1848. 1848. Now, some of you being here in Pittsburgh, and uh, Dr. Moncrease, who I'll introduce momentarily, uh, she will give you some thoughts about Martin Delaney. Well, Martin Delaney in 1850. Um, was one of uh, two other African-American men who were 
accepted to Harvard Medical School. This is 1850, 1848, AMA is, is, uh, is established. Well, uh, within two weeks of Martin Delaney and the other two fellows at Harvard, uh, the white students there uh, protested and uh, Martin Delaney and his two uh, compadres uh, were uh, asked politely to leave. I mention that because um, in 1895, uh, you may uh, know that Booker T. Washington uh, gave a speech. It's called the Atlanta Compromise. 1895. 1895, Booker T. Washington does the Atlantic Compromise, but also in 1895, as I mentioned, the National Medical Association was established. Uh, what was unique about the National Medical Association, it wasn't just physicians, it was also included uh, persons who were in the field of social work. It included teachers, it included dentists, it included um, uh, persons of, of faith in the ministry. So it had that multi or interdisciplinary uh, composition in the, uh, uh, for the uh, National Medical Association, 1895. So the, 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 in 1896, after the Atlantic Compromise speech, we had what? 1896. 1896, we had Plessy versus Ferguson. That was a separate but unequal, meaning Jim Crow. I mention that because, again, these two associations uh, are established, or at least at the turn of the century, the 1900 AMA and the NMA. Why were they critical in terms of the development and the legacy of black medical schools and the departments in those medical schools? This, I'm sure, Dr. Moncrees will provide us with some, some insight. Um, after uh, Dr. Moncrees provides her remarks, we will have a reception immediately uh, after the tour uh, downstairs. Uh, and so we'll take your uh, questions here, but again, in a much more informal uh, atmosphere, uh, we'll uh, engage one another uh, during the reception. Now, Dr. Moncrees, Anita Moncrees, uh, is someone that uh, we've had the pleasure of knowing for one or two five, ten, maybe twenty, uh, maybe even thirty years. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, time does uh, trickle away. Uh, so Dr. Moncrees um, is Associate Professor at Wayne State University. Um, she uh, is also uh, uh, a historian at, at her, ch her church in, in, in Detroit. Uh, she did her undergraduate uh, work at Wayne State University and uh, MPH at Harvard. Uh, so, uh, additionally, uh, uh, Dr. Mypreece uh, was also, uh, for me, it was quite beneficial, is that um, she was our medical director for school and adolescent health uh, when I ran the health department in the city of Detroit. Uh, Dr. Mypreece is um, in the same vein as um, Mindy Fullerlo. She is a physician, activist, advocate uh, in terms of social change and making things happen uh, for people in general to improve the human condition. Along with uh, accompanying uh, Dr. Moncrees is her niece, uh, Brittany. And Brittany uh, has something in common with, uh, oh, Brittany Moncrees, excuse me. Uh, Brit Brittany uh, completed her studies at Howard, her undergraduate and her graduate degree at Howard University, uh, where my daughter and my grandson is now in school. My daughter is, is fortunately, she's paying still, pay unfortunately, still paying those bills. Um, and uh, she's also uh, uh, accompanied by Demetrius. Demetrius is uh, ninth grader, Demetrius? Yeah. And uh, so, Without any uh, additional uh, delay, uh, Dr. Moncrees, the day is the yours. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure, my honor, to be here today to share the story of my family and our travels and our history uh, with you. This is uh, Minority Health Month, and the health disparities that exist today, they existed 
back when these schools were being formed right after the Civil War, back when this country was being formed, these disparities still existed. Probably the only time these disparities didn't exist is back in the ancient Egyptian times. And we're going to talk a, a, a tad bit about that. But health disparities is, is, is something that um, until we take ownership of, will continue to exist. Um, I have with me my uh, niece and my nephew, not just because uh, I like them <laughs> and they're here with me today, but they were part of uh, this, this whole experience. Um, I wanted to apologize for this first slide. Um, yesterday in Round Here, you know how you do things at the last minute? So I was going to take care of all these slides and everything when I got here. Yesterday in Round Here was Demetrius and I first experience firsthand with a tornado. We were driving uh, here from Detroit and um, got a little excited because that was our first tornado. And so when we finally made it here, instead of being settled and ready to work, we were still working through that. And Brittany was coming from New York now, the direction that the storm was moving in, and she didn't get here till 1.30. So we really didn't get peace of mind. And it, this slide just got by me when we were trying to tighten things up um, this morning. So that's that explanation. Won't see that again, hopefully ever. <laughs> and I left the pointer thing over there. So oh, thank you. Um, this just tells you a little bit about us and our, our background. But what's most important on this slide to me is that I have five nieces. And for all five of them uh, went to historical black colleges and universities uh, of their own choice. I have, uh, I don't know how many nephews, <laughs> okay, but all of my nephews have, uh, who have been old enough to go to college, have attended college, um, and one of them went to the MSU, but the other two went to historical black colleges. DJ told me on the way down here, he's thinking about going to Michigan State, that's okay. He has a cousin who doesn't, but they're, they're doing things. Richard is not here today. He's our expert on the Flexner Report, okay? So today you get my opinion of the Flexner Report instead of uh, Richard's. And the reason why Richard is our expert on it, and Richard is a student, a second year student at Morehouse, is because as we were doing these travels, as we were doing these travels, we were driving around in, in my truck, and we had one month that we were gonna hit all these schools, and we couldn't hit all these schools in one month. It took us six weeks and we still missed two. But while we were traveling, D, um, Richard asked me this question. If it's taking us all this time driving 70 miles an hour plus on, on interstate highways to do this, and we can only hit six schools, how could Flexner do that? And it never dawned on me in all my years to question whether Flexner actually went to these schools. Or, or in the process of how he got gathered his information. So it was out of the 16-year-old's mouth, okay? <laughs> so he asked the question, so that became his area of expertise, okay? And so you're gonna get my impressions on it, you're not gonna get his. And at the age of 16, the other thing was, once he asked the question, we had to go to the Library of Congress to look at Flexner's notes and everything. Because he was 16, he was not old enough to go into his room, so I had to go in by myself, okay? And usually when we do things, um, we check each other's work, okay? So nobody checked my work because I could, he wasn't old enough. He's 20 now, so he's old enough to go in there, so the two of us are going back. And the holes that I found, he can verify, okay? So he's not with us. Demetrius DJ is here with us today. He was in the seventh grade when we uh, uh, did this work. And so he's gonna come and tell you why, how he got involved in this, this project and why his, his schools are his schools. And the next slide and so forth. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, we, we know that these, dis that these uh, disparities exist. We know um, that we have for example, in the history of this country, there have been 19 black medical schools and departments. Most people don't know that. 
Most people, when they think about the black medical schools in the practice, they think of Howard, Meharry, Morehouse, and Drew. And we don't realize that Morehouse and Drew have only been around since, well, well Morehouse, I mean, Drew since uh, 1966, and Morehouse since the 1970s. So for a long time, there were only two black medical schools in this country, and that was um, uh, Howard and Meharry. Okay? But Howard and Meharry, they ended up graduating more African Americans than any other school, but Howard and Meharry had their hands tied by the flexion report. And they had their hands tied by the flexion report because they were only schools that were allowed to be left open after the flexion report, and they were only allowed to teach certain things. But I'm not the flexion expert, but we'll get to that. So we'll move we'll on. So of those other 19 schools, who were they? Why did they start? There's a gentleman um, out there who I call the guru of the black medical schools and departments. And his name is Todd Sabat. And he's out of um, North Carolina, okay? And Todd has done a lot of research on this topic. And so doing this work, one of the things we did was we contacted Todd to see, you know, what he did and why he did it, okay? And this is what we learned the very first week of our field study, our field project. We took Todd's book with us because it had more information than anybody else on this planet had. We read Todd's section on our very first school that we went to, which happened to be the Louisville National Medical College. We went to Louisville, Kentucky, and we went to the research center at the, at the University of Louisville, and we verified all the things that, that Todd had, had found, and we felt very, very good about it until we got home, and, and we being DJ, Richard, and I, and we started talking about it, and what we had learned was nothing. Because what we had done was what Todd had done. So the next day, we decided that we were gonna take, we were gonna approach things different. We were gonna go and visit these places first, learn about them, and then read what Todd had to say. And when we did that, we actually opened a new chapter to Todd's research. So when we start talking about the 19 schools, um, Todd talks about 15, okay? And so we've actually added some schools to the list. Some schools in, uh, that were thought not to exist or that people knew very little about but had been just not counted. We count now because we know a little bit more about them. There's much more to be learned, but we know a little bit more. Um, we also learned why these schools opened when they opened. You see, one of the things as a doctor, I, when, I was, when I teach and work with medical students, I like to tell them there's no magic. Things just don't happen. Things are connected. And so in our presentation, as we talk about these medical schools in some detail, and, that, and that's given the amount of time that we have to talk about them, you'll see that there is no magic. There was a conscious thought into why these schools opened when they opened and where they opened. These thoughts, you know, sometimes went to a lot of detail, sometimes were very superficial. We're going to go try to get through uh, the 19 of them. We've never been able to do that in the past, <laughs> but we'll try to today. Um, the legacy of these schools, though, they don't begin here in the United States. That's, that's the, the trick. The trick is to make you think that blacks didn't do anything until after the Civil War, and then we all suddenly, magically, we can think again. Okay? <laughs> no. The legacy of, of the black medical schools and departments, like all medical schools, actually begins in Africa. Um, the first medical schools that are documented, and as physicians, as researchers, as scientists, we like to document things, we like the data. So the first ones were actually documented, were documented to be in Africa over five, over 3,000 years ago. And if you uh, visit uh, Egypt today, you can still see the first uh, the pyramid uh, up, up in the uh, upper left-hand corner there, Saqqara. It still exists today. This is supposed to be the site of the first medical school. 
and the uh, structure that's next to it is supposed to be um, the site where the pharmacy and so forth was. And this um, picture down here, this is my pointer, okay, and this picture down here depicts a schematic. That's a DJ, see how he is? It, it, it depicts a schematic of what the gardens would look like if the pharmacists would um, grow their herbs and um, different um, um, plants and so forth to make the, their drugs. So these have been documented to exist. Next slide, please. This is closer up. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. And so not only in Africa, but this is a, a, a depiction of a medical, supposed to be a medical school of a university in Timbuktu in 1591. So uh, medical schools, documented medical schools have been documented 3,000 years ago, not here, but back in Africa, not in Europe, back in Africa. Next slide. Oh, okay, I'm gonna hold that right there. Okay, so we also talk about documentation for uh, med the medical textbooks. The first medical textbooks documented were written on papyrus. Again, in Africa, ancient Egypt. The first known, ears known to throat doctor, GI doctors, um, or ophthalmologists, dentists, documented, have all been documented as coming from Africa. So these, the knowledge of these people uh, at existence was wiped away by this period that we call colonial slavery, enslavement. But before then, blacks, Africans were doing things and writing them down, uh, giving us history. Uh, one, if you go and see the exhibit, the very first panel in the exhibit talks about African contribution. And you know, some of them are just, uh, for example, the symbol for the drugstore, you remember the old symbol for the drugstore, the RX? Okay, if you go back and you, and you look at, at our first panel, you see the eye of Horus. Okay, and what ancient Egyptians used to do is, in different, when they wrote a prescription, they would make that, it almost looks like the, the RX that you see, and in different parts of that, they would put the measurements or the amount of a certain ingredient that needed to be added in order to make a certain concoction. And that's where that RX that you see at the drugstore comes from, okay? But that period of colonial enslavement kind of uh, had uh, urged in a time we had to get rid of that these people had knowledge. And so that period of colonial enslavement ushered in a time where that history was just wiped away. We have remnants, though, here in the New World. We had African people of African descent, both free and enslaved, practicing medicine. And if you look at the second panel downstairs, it, is, it talks about those contributions, some of those contributions that both free and enslaved Africans were making. That's not in our, the book that you have here because this book focuses just on what happens uh, those 19 medical schools, okay? As a matter of fact, if you have this book, I want you to look at it and read it and enjoy this book, but I want you to, to, to understand that this book originally started off as a children's book. It started off as a children's book because we wanted to reach out to, to kids and let you know kids you know learn a little bit about the black medical schools. But as I was writing it and working on it with, with um, the uh, co-creators, the co-authors, DJ said, my nickname is Sister, Auntie Sister, this is not a children's book. <laughs> because the information there was not direct, directed at children. And the information there, people, adults didn't know. I didn't know it, you know, people didn't know. So we had to change it from a, a, a children's book to what we call the student's book, okay? So this is a, it's just like an introduction to all the information that I want you to know. We couldn't put all the information I want you to know in this book. And this book was really supposed to be a step above a coloring book, but it, <laughs> it didn't do that. Okay, so the second panel will, uh, will talk to you about the pre-colonial period, uh, the colonial enslavement period up into the Civil War, and it'll tell you some knowledge that we all should have. You mentioned Martin Delaney, okay, 
but um, it talks about the very first African American uh, uh, physician to get an MD degree. He couldn't get it in the United States. Okay, he, he had to go over to Scotland and get an MD degree. His name was um, uh, J James McClure Smith. The second uh, person that you can notice on the panel, we don't even have a picture of today. It's, and he's from around this Pittsburgh area. He wasn't born here when he grew up here. David Jones Peck. He was the first person of African American descent to get an MD degree in the United States. He did that at Rush University in 1847. Okay. So, and of course, we have to do the first African American woman to get an MD degree in the United States. Again, she's on the panel. We don't have a picture of her either. When I say we don't, that means there is no known picture of them anywhere. And that is Rebecca Lee Crumlin. Okay, so if you visit the second panel, you'll you'll see that information down there. The third panel is when I finally can talk about the black medical schools and departments and um, why why they happen when they happen. There's a ton of information there. Take your take your time. Look at it. Come back. It's okay. But we're going to start by sharing some of that information with you. Um, we're going to start by having my niece Brittany. She's going to come up and share. Um, starting with Howard University. And we did that, not by accident, there's no magic. <laughs> she went to Howard, okay? And so if you go to some place, you need to know something about it, right? Okay, Brittany. As my aunt explained, I went to Howard University. Um, I went there for undergraduate school and graduate school. Um, I, be, I came a part of this project um, because at the time, I was actually living in Philadelphia and I was working in Philadelphia. And my nephew and my brother and my aunt, they were taking their trip to visit all the black medical schools or the locations where they once were. And I just happened to be along the way. So, <laughs> so they stopped in Philly um, to picked me up, I went with them to Lincoln University, and then that's how I got involved in the project. So we're gonna start off by talking about um, Howard University. So after the Civil War, the, you know you have former um, enslaved Africans who are now free. So one of the big issues there was healthcare. Now during slavery, you know, the slave owners, they made sure that their slaves had, or their enslaved Africans had the right um, health care because that was beneficial to them. So now after the Civil War where everyone's free, they have no reason of making sure that people have the proper health care. So during the time, you had about 8 million free men now. And President Lincoln decided to come up with the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865. And that would help provide that health care. You would get health um, care professionals. Uh, that was his goal. Now the Freedmen's Bureau was only supposed to last um, a, about a year. It wasn't a long-term um, situation there. So in 1867, Howard University was founded. Now the commissioner for the Freedmen's Bureau was General Oliver O. Howard. So naturally, that's how Howard was named after General Howard. And Howard University was founded in 1867. Now the original vision for Howard University, I know we call it um, a HBCU, a historically black college, but Howard was actually for everyone. Anyone who wanted to get an education, you could get an education at Howard University. In fact, the original seal of Howard University actually has different shades of different people on the seal. And you'll even see Native American, um, black, white. It was for everyone. So the original idea was to make Howard University a theological school. However, General Howard had a different idea. He wanted to eventually expand to a medical school, a law school, and a school for agriculture. And there's different reasons as to why they chose Washington, D.C. as the location for Howard University. A few reasons. One is that it had a lot of free men there. The number of uh, freed African, uh, people of African descent were right there in the D.C. area. It was a large number. So you could reach more people by having Washington, D.C. Also, General Howard lived in D.C. So by him being in D.C., he would have access to the school, first-hand access. So he can watch over the day-to-day -day operations. There's another reason is because the military presence was there in D.C. So, and of course, by General Howard being a general in the military, he also had those kind of connections, those military connections, and can make sure that Howard University had the military presence that it needed. 
The other reason why Howard University was chosen to be in Washington, D.C. is because of the budget. Now, Howard receives government funding still to this day. It's one of the, it's, it's the only HBCU to get government funding. So by having Howard University in Washington, D.C., General Howard could oversee all the funds. He could make sure that the money was going to where it was supposed to go. So this made Washington, D.C. the prime spot for Howard University to get it going. Now in 1868, Howard University opened its medical school. Now the medical school consisted of, um, of course, medical school, pharmacy, and a hospital. And the way the model or the blueprint for the medical school was modeled after uh, the University of Michigan. So in its first class, as I said, you know, Howard University was for everyone. So it wasn't just blacks that graduated um, from that first class, but in that first class, it only had eight students. And at the time, because you had, during the, it's right after the Civil War, because you had free people now that are going to school to get that medical school, during the day, you still had to work. So you, you still had a trade. So Howard was mainly a night school. So you would work during the day, you know, go to school at night. And actually downstairs in the exhibit, in one of the cases, you'll actually see um, a lamp to represent how at night, this is where the studies uh, took place during the day you work. You'll see that all downstairs at the exhibit. So um, one of the, the, well, the first faculty member, uh, black faculty member at Howard University's medical school was Dr. Alexander Thomas Augusta. Now, the reason why these talks and going around and sharing this information is so important because when we were doing our research, we found him to be the first um, at first, we thought he was the only black medical um, faculty member. But then, we met someone else along the way who had some other information for us. And we found that actually the following year, in 1869, Howard University took on its second black faculty me member for the medical school. And that his name was Purvis. He was actually the assistant surgeon general at the time. He also served on the board of directors, I mean the board of trustees. So over the years, Howard University has graduated, the Howard Medical School has graduated over 6,000 uh, graduates, black graduates. And like I said before, to this day, Howard University still receives government funding. And that's why um, even Howard was able to survive to today, even after the Flexner Report. And another thing that we discovered in our research is at the time, um, a little connection there, William Flexner actually served on Howard University's Board of Trustees. So that's a little connection that a lot of people didn't know at the time, but it can also speak to as to why Howard University was able to survive the Flexner Report. So you might ask, we know why General Howard chose Washington, D.C. as his location, but how did he even learn or figure out how to come up with the plan, how to come up with the curriculum, how to come up with the blueprint for Howard University. You had to go somewhere else to see, well, how are you doing it? Or how are, you know, how's that format into play? So there were different options that he had. There were other black universities that were already existing prior to um, the Civil War. There were other universities already existing. One being Cheney, which is in Pennsylvania. So Cheney was run by Quakers. And if you're familiar with Quakers, they're pretty strict. The lifestyle is strict. The way they ran day-to-day -day operations, it was strict, their daily lives. So for General Howard, it's like, man, I can't go to Cheney and learn from them because they have this strict curriculum that's not going to work for me. So the next option is Wilberforce. Wilberforce was a historic, is a historically black college in Ohio. But Wilberforce was started by white Methodists. And during that time in 1863, they got word that the Confederates were going to come into Ohio near Wilberforce and they were going to set up camp there. So the white uh, Methodists were like, well, we don't want to be a part of that. We can't have any taken of that. So they decided, okay, well, let's shut down the school. But the AME church, they said, well, wait a minute. You don't have to shut down the school. We'll take it over. So the AME church took over Wilberforce which created a problem for General Howard because at that time, we have to remember it's during the Civil War, what would it look like for General Howard, a white man, getting advice from black people and help? So Wilberforce was coming out. So his only other option after that was Lincoln University because Lincoln University was up and running during that time. 
Lincoln University is in Oxford, Pennsylvania, and it was originally called Ashland University. The school didn't change its name to Lincoln University until 1866 when Lincoln was assassinated. So Lincoln University was founded in 1854 by a Presbyterian minister named John William Dickey and his wife Sarah Crescent. Both Sarah was a Quaker. Um, General Howard, in working with Lincoln, he decided they came up with a deal. And the deal that he had with Lincoln University was, okay, if I come here and I learn and I get all the information I need to go start this other school, I'll give you guys money from the Freedmen's Bureau. That was the deal they came up with. So General Howard actually served on Lincoln University's Board of Trustees. Now, in 1870, Lincoln University opened its own medical school. It was mainly for, it was just for males at the time. And it became the first black medical school in the North. Okay? So, it's the first black medical in the school in the North. However, as you can see on here, it only lasted six years. It closed in 1876. And there were a number of reasons as to why it closed. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever been to Oxford, Pennsylvania before, but it's, <laughs> it's very rural. It's kind of like in the middle of nowhere. So location was an issue. So being in Oxford, Pennsylvania, you know, this is a black school. Your students need protection, especially during those times. And it was hard to protect the students being in the location that they were. It was also hard to reach the students. You, had the, you can take a train, but after that, it's horse and carriage getting there. So location was an issue. Also the faculty. The faculty found it hard because of the location to live there. So if you don't have enough faculty that wants to work, you come across another problem. And the last reason is finances. As I said before, the deal with General Howard was, hey, I'll get information for you to start my school, and we'll give you money from the Freedmen's Bureau. Well, the problem is, by then, Freedmen's Bureau was broke. So they couldn't get money to support the medical school at Lincoln University. So for some time, Lincoln University said, okay, well, we'll support the medical school, we'll find a way. But those finances ran out, and unfortunately, it had to close. Now, the other issue um, with Lincoln University, just in general, was it was known to be a really, have a really, really strict curriculum. It was known as the Black Princeton at the time. So for a lot of people, they would start at the school, but couldn't finish. So you saw that was a lot of the problems with the medical school in particular. Uh, I believe there were six students who went to the school. Two ended up finishing their medical school at Howard, and another two went on to Yale. Because at that time, it was okay to go to one school, switch over to another, and finish your degree there. So that was common. So um, they didn't have a lot of graduates from that time period, from uh, when the medical school was open until 1876. They didn't have a lot of graduates. Um, but over the years, um, Lincoln University, of course, has graduated a number of students, black students. Um, and so that leads us to you. Oh, well, this is a picture of Ashman University at the time, Ashman Institute. Lincoln University now. And it was interesting because when we actually went to Lincoln University to visit, no one knew anything about there being a medical school. They had no idea, there was no sign of it, no one knew. So that's, that's what we found really interesting moving along in this project is because yes, as my I mentioned, we have the book written by Todd um, about black medical schools, but there was so much information that Todd didn't know. There was so much information when we went to these universities that people on the campus didn't know. So it was really interesting to be there and to see firsthand how this black history, how our history took place then. So now we're going to move on to Central Tennessee. Well, before we get to Central Tennessee. Thank you. <laughs> My niece. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the no magic part begins. Howard is the first place because that's where General Howard is. Lincoln is in second place because, hey, we there was only three black colleges before the Civil War, and that was the best of the three for, for me to go to advice. So Lincoln is the second. Okay, so where are we going to put the third? Why do we need a third? We've got millions of people who don't have health coverage. We have to find some schools to educate these people. Okay, so, and these schools are opening, and we're showing you, Howard has never closed, but you, you saw Lincoln close, and you're going to see a lot of these schools close. A lot of these schools are going to close before they realize there's a problem. Okay, 
We call it the four F's. The four F's, the faculty, facility, funding, and Flexner. Those are the things that will lead to the failure of the institution, the four F's. And Brittany pointed out a couple of those uh, four F's with Lincoln. The thing that will save Howard is the funding. It's the only black medical school in the country that was ever funded by the government, and is still funded today, OK? So that was what helped. And then, of course, she said Flexner later on actually gets on the board. But we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll get to that story. Okay. So there's no magic. The third school, the third school turns out to be, the, she mentioned the American uh, Missionary Association, the AMA. Okay. They had the mission of going around the South and opening schools, not professional schools, but schools for the newly freed men to go and, and get a basic education, some basic knowledge. And one of the people who was doing that was also on the board um, of uh, Lincoln at the same time as Howard was on the board of Lincoln. Okay? And this person going to the South, think about it, after the, after the Civil War, what was the most progressive state in the South? Louisiana. Louisiana. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And so, if you were going to open a school, the next obvious place to open that school would be in the state of Louisiana. These slides are a little out of order, and I, I, I've already told you about that. So the third school would have been straight university. And if you look in the back of the book, we missed all 19 in the order. Okay? But again, there's no magic. Straight university was opened uh, in New Orleans with the thought of educating not just people who've been freed uh, after the Civil War, but before the Civil War, there were uh, professional blacks in the state of Louisiana, in the city of New Orleans. But you were not allowed to teach blacks how to read, write. I don't care, free or enslaved. So now was an opportunity for those professional people to send their kids to school. Also, there was well-to-do whites uh, before the Civil War who had black children who wanted their children to have the opportunity to have an education. Now was the time after the Civil War where those kids could go to school. So the first, um, and we call it college, but it wasn't college college like, like we think of it today. It was an opportunity for people to learn to read and write. Some who did know how to read and write, it was an opportunity for them to get more advanced learning. But the first school straight was set up for the well-to-do um, African-American descendants. Okay? It wasn't set up for everybody. But unfortunately, the story about straight is um, it opened before Lincoln closed. So it didn't know the problems that Lincoln was going to have. And Lincoln didn't know it was not going to get the money from the federal government. It thought it would, be, particularly with Howard, General Howard being on the board. So when Strait opens, Strait um, leadership has an agreement with the state government that they will, the state government will give $30,000 to support a medical department. Great. So with that, the leadership of Strait goes out and they recruit a doctor by the name of T.J. Newman out of, of Chicago. He was actually born in New Orleans, but he's living in Chicago and has written pa papers and has a good reputation, even though we cannot document where he went to medical school at. Okay? They recruit him to come back to New Orleans to open the medical school, medical department at Strait. Now, as Brittany mentioned, a medical department is a little bit different from a medical uh, a college. Medical department has uh, a, a school of medicine for doctors to, to, to train doctors. A medical department also trains dentists, pharmacists, and sometimes in some departments, nursing. A medical college used primarily just treat, uh, trains doctors. So Strait uh, was opening a medical department as Meharry did. Okay, but everybody wasn't happy with Strait opening a medical department. And as a matter of fact. Sometimes happy people are brilliant people, okay? And so 
the agreement was that the state government would give $30,000 for straight to open this medical department. Straight recruited Dr. Newman at $1,000 a year, which was good money back then. Dr. Newman was supposed to be able to recruit faculty. They were supposed to be able to get the facilities. And, uh, and Dr. Newman was just a happy camper until somebody in the state legislature said, yes, we have $30,000 directed for straight, but the $30,000 only can go to a state school. And straight is a private school. Therefore, you don't get the $30,000. Okay? And so when they didn't get the 30000 Newman couldn't hire new faculty. Newman tried to teach all the courses himself, but he just physically couldn't. Okay? And so after one year, after one year, straight closed. It did graduate a pharmacist, but it never graduated a physician. Okay? Remember, there's no magic. The gentleman from the AMA is traveling through the country setting up these schools continues to travel. Here comes Demetrius traveling up here. Alright, so Central Tennessee College was founded in 1865 and it was supported by the AMA. It was the first college of higher learning founded solely for the education of free men or African American people in the country. Its medical department department was founded in 1876. Bishop Davis Wargott Clark was hired by the AMA to travel to the South, as my aunt was saying, to establish new schools for the uh, newly freed man. In February of 1866, after a long day of writing charges for new schools, uh, Bishop Clark was asked by the governor of Tennessee, which was Governor Rock Brownlow, John Braden, and several state senators to write a charter for a Negro school. So later that night, he returned to his room and wrote a draft of a charter for a Negro school that he named the Central Tennessee College for the General and Theological Education of Colored People and sent this to Governor Brownlow before he left Nashville the next day. A year later, on October 3rd, 1867, Bishop Clark visited with Reverend John Braden who was the principal of the Negro school, he quickly wrote a charter for it a year ago. John Braden became the first president of Central Tennessee College, and he recruited the first dean, which was George Hubbard, and money to open the medical department for the Meharry Brothers. And John Braden and the Meharry Brothers, they had a close bond because they were close friends. And the reason, now you, you will ask, like, why would the Meharry Brothers when John Brennan asked the Meharry brothers to fund the school, why would they just willingly accept with like no no real purpose to accept? Well, the reason why they gave John Brennan thirty thousand dollars to fund the school was well, the medical department is because it was a stormy night and the youngest Meharry brother he was out traveling traveling through Tennessee delivering salt to people because that was his job and he got caught in the storm and. His wagon broke down and his wheel fell off. And just when he thought, like, you know, it was over for him, a Negro family came along, gave him, they saw him on the road, so they took him back to his house. They gave him shelter, a place to sleep, some food and warm clothes. And when the youngest man had brother went to sleep, the family sought his wagon and repaired it so that the next day when he woke up, he was able to see his wagon and go back on his deliveries. And the founder of Meharry Medical College. The reason why it's named Meharry now is because the family the family donated thirty thousand dollars in honor of the Negro family whose name they forgot. So they would have named it after the Negro family but they forgot the name so they just named it Meharry Medical College. George Whipple Hubbard was the founder and the first president of Meharry Medical College. In 1875, Hubbard enrolled at the University of Tennessee and graduated in 1876. So, it's really, I guess, yes, it's really uncommon because normally if you're the head of a medical school, you will have to be a doctor. But in his case, he actually earned his doctor's degree while he was the head of a medical college. 
and he graduated well, yeah. in October 1876. He worked under the, under the direction of Dr. John W. Braden, assisted by Dr. W. J. Snead, a Confederate, a Confederate veteran, to open the Mary Medical Department of Central Tennessee College. Initially, the college enrolled fewer than a dozen students. Hubbard then enrolled at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, from which he received his degree as a medical doctor in 1879. With the closing of Central Tennessee College, Meharry Medical College emerged as an independent medical training institution of which Hubbard served as president for 45 years. Of note, George Whipple Hubbard served as dean of Flint Medical College in New Orleans. So while he was at the top of Meharry Medical College, he was also at the top of Flint Medical College. And right here, you can see all the graduates of Meharry all the, uh, yeah, all the graduates that came from Mary. And this is me and my uncle at uh, Mary Medical College in 2014. And yeah. This is the historical marker that's in front of Mary, and it reads, Mary Medical College established in 1876 through the efforts of Dr. George W. Hubbard, Dr. William J. Snead, and Samuel Meharry is the only AMA credited, properly endowed, predominantly Negro medical school in the world. During its first 90 years of service, it trained more Negro physicians and dentists than any other institution. We do, we do a tag team, and we're gonna do this, this school uh, next is completely out of order. It's the last uh, black medical school that opened. But the, this school has been documented in so many sources as no information is available on this school. Very limited information is available on this school. So we're going to give you information that nobody has. So you can take this out into the universe and say, I know more than anybody else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> So this school, medical, I'm going to butcher this word, <laughs> chirurgical, there we go, chirurgical and theological college of Christ Institution. I'm going to call it Christ Institute for short. Now this university, well this college is my favorite. Yeah, I went to Howard. My bison would probably kill me. But this is my favorite. And um, mainly because of the information that was found there that was not known. So. Christ Institute was founded in 1885 by Dr. George Kennard, and that's Dr. George Kennard picture there. Um, so Christ Institute, it's in Baltimore, Maryland, and when it was founded, at the time, blacks weren't able to go to, they didn't have any other place to go to get any kind of health care or any kind of medical treatment. Now the date that uh, Christ Institute was founded is very important because it's founded in 1885, which is four years, I believe it was four or five years before John Hopkins. So this was the only, um, the only health care, health facility in the area at that time, before John Hopkins was founded. So the way Christ Institute operated was there was, um, there on the first floor of Christ Institute is the church. Dr. Kennard was also a minister. And so it was a theological school, um, and they actually have a church on the first floor. The second floor was the medical school, and the third floor was the hospital. So during that time, of course, blacks went there for medical treatment. Uh, if you were Jewish, you went there for medical treatment because you couldn't be seen in any other place. And then at, also, they took people who didn't have insurance or didn't have money. So you could go to Christ Institute and go to the hospital and stay there a dollar a day. So you can only imagine the amount of people that came in and out of that institution. So it was also known as like the Miracle House. So by Dr. Kennard being a minister, um, it's known to have performed different miracles over the years. That was the reputation, rep, reputation that it had. Uh, there's been stories about um, a blind woman going into the church and being able to see. Uh, there's been stories about Dr. Kennard rescuing a girl from a, a fire. So it was known as the healing house. And even today, 
you know, they, they're still different. You'll see people go there and write down different things that they want or aspire in life and put it up there because it's known as miracles. So at the time, as my aunt mentioned, it was one of the last um, institutes to be founded prior to Flexer. So it was one of two to be founded at that time. Um, the medical school was chartered in 1900. However, there were some problems with that charter being that, for one, one of the charter members only signed with an X. So they created problems down the line for the university. Um, now, around, there's no, we, there's different records as, to, as far as when the school closed. Um, some say 1908, it closed in 1908, just two years um, following uh, Flexner. And then there's other reports also that said that it closes in 1912. So we're still not sure about the actual date of when the school closed. Now, my favorite thing about this school is, as we mentioned, um, Todd, who wrote the book about black medical schools, the only book that's out there, the only information that we have, um, he mentioned that Christ Institute no longer existed. So when my aunt came to visit me, um, I believe, no, I came down to visit you in DC. And we were like, okay, well, let's go to Baltimore and just look at the area of where it used to be. We knew it was on, uh, I believe, Insor Street. That was its second location. It had a different location at first. It was on Sterling Avenue, I believe, and then now Insor Street. So we're like, okay, well, let's just go over there and see. We go over there and see, lo and behold, it says Christ it's Institute still Baptist there. Church. <laughs> still there. It looks like an abandoned building on the outside because it's been, it's gone through a lot of the air spires, um, it's like broken windows, but it's still standing. So we go, we knock on the door, no one answers. So my aunt had to go back to Michigan. But then by me working in Philly, I decided, okay, well, let me just go over there another time. So one day in the morning, actually, because I always work weekends, I work in news. So no holidays, nothing. So one morning I said, well, okay, well, let me go to Baltimore, which is about an hour and a half away from Philly. I go to Baltimore, knock on the door again. Someone answers. And her name is Dr. Jo Farley. She's the minister there now. And so I go inside and I'm talking to her. I tell her about our research. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I've heard a little bit about, you know, some of the, some of the history here, but I don't have much. So I decided to go back another time and sit down and talk to her and interview her, and she took me on a tour throughout the whole um, building of what you could access, because like I said, part of it had been destroyed in fire. The, what you see is the front half where the church actually is. Right now it only operates as a church, but there's a whole back side that probably stretches um, right to, there's kind of like a gate right here. But that whole back side had been destroyed in the fire, so you can't access that part. So um, we went and we took a tour, and she showed us different things there that Dr. Kennard used with his students that were still there in that building. So I found that this church to be, this school to be the most interesting, and I actually have a video. Where it kind of looks on the inside, now again, the inside of the, the church is not as kept as because of the things that's happened over the years and it's issue with finances, but um, you can see some of the some of the stuff that was that's still in the church that was there then. Baltimore, Maryland, on the corner of Insor Street, stands one of the city's most prized historical buildings. All day, drivers pass by it, not even wondering what this building is or maybe why it's there. Yet. This building, known as the Medical, Chirurgical, and Theological College of Christ Institute, is truly a treasure. Opening in 1885, at least four years before its neighboring school, John Hopkins, Christ Institute was the only facility in the Baltimore area that would treat African Americans and the Jewish community. In fact, it's the only institution in this area that taught African Americans how to become doctors. We spoke to Dr. Joe Farley, the current pastor of Christ Institute. Yes, this building divided into three sections. Um, the bottom floor was a church, second floor a college which graduated 120 black doctors and nurses, uh, four years before Hopkins even started. And on the third floor was a 25-bed hospital where he charged uh, only a dollar a day stay for four people. It was the vision of Dr. George Kennard, who was also a medical physician and minister. But he was known as the 
lover of the poor and the needy. During the 1800s, the building was used as a pottery. Researchers believe Dr. Kennard bought the building in the early 1900s, altering it to a church, medical school, and hospital. Go, Dr. Uh, Kennard, so much of gratitude. And really, uh, people don't really have the knowledge or give him the credit that he deserves for what he's done to not only this community, but I understand um, through some documentation that he's had nursing homes and other parts of Maryland and all kinds of stuff. The institute was once located here at 1600 Sterling Street before moving to Ensor Street. Now, John Hopkins Medical Center sits in its place. Hopkins owes this place to Dr. a little bit of gratitude. Christ Institute is believed to be the first medical school to enforce a three-year curriculum, a model that John Hopkins would later be recognized for implementing. Dr. Farley took us on a tour of the church, showing us that some of the equipment used in the late 1800s and early 1900s is still there. This was the site of the school. And this tape, this, this, this tape, and in this area, is where Dr. Kennard tore um, $129,000. Yeah, right in this area. And that table is authentic. That's the actual table that he used to do that. You can stop by the wood. It's, it's heavy, extremely heavy. In the early 2000s, there was a fire in an adjacent building. Efforts to put that fire out caused damage to Christ Institute. Now, half of the church is taped off. Yes. Okay. That caused all kind of mold and all kind of damage and you know, that kind of, so that's pretty much why it's in the shape it's in now. Despite its hardships, the story of medical, chirurgical, and theological Christ Institute is a story of survival and faith, endurance. The dreams and spirits of those who came before still soar on. It's, it's been through a lot. Yeah. That school was forgotten. So you, you actually have more information than a lot of folks have on that school. And, and uh, uh, through uh, our efforts and uh, another gentleman, Philip Morrell, you may have heard of him. He does the antique uh, uh, show, road shows. Yes. Um, he's a historian here uh, uh, locally, but nationally know uh, we're trying to do our best to uh, preserve this school there are efforts now you know sometimes when, when people don't know about you 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 coast along long for years and nothing happens and then when people like us stumble upon you we get all excited and we start talking about it now john hopkins wants to buy the, the church and the church is in financial trouble now they're considering you know selling it we're afraid that it is not made a historical site the next step is that it would be destroyed. And so while we got excited about our find, we may have uh, inadvertently, you know, set something else into place. So we're, we're trying to work on a documentary to try to uh, save uh, this particular school. So that's the reason why I wanted to jump ahead and make sure we touch upon that one. Um, this school not only trained doctors, but it trained nurses and pharmacists. And, and just like uh, Brittany said, it opened, it opened before it was chartered. It opened in 1885 uh, okay. and 1895. Oh, 1885, it was chartered in 1900. Thank you. Okay. Um, and it opened, uh, just prior, it, it opened just prior to John Hopkins. And uh, like she was saying, Negroes and Jews were not allowed to be seen at different hospitals, including John Hopkins. And so they went into an agreement, actually, with John Hopkins that they would see the, the Negroes and the Jewish patients. And uh, well, John Hopkins kind of reneged on their part of the agreement. They made sure that the Negro and Jewish patients were seen at this hospital. This, they would not accept uh, the patients that they said that they would. But that's another story. Okay, okay. so uh, it's 3 o'clock, and I want to mention a few things um, to you. We The first schools that were open, the ones that we touched upon, were not opened by blacks. 
Okay, they were open really by uh, religious um, denominations. We didn't talk about Leonard, which would have been the, the next school that opened. And Leonard uh, opened, and this is just our uh, our opinion. We don't have documentation that says this, but uh, Leonard was opened by the American Baptists. Okay, and we feel that the reason why Leonard opened its medical school uh, there was because the Baptists got jealous. All these other schools are being opened by Methodists, and the Methodists and the Baptists were like, if the Methodists can do it, why can't we open the school? And Leonard is the old, uh, is Shaw University is the oldest black school in the South, okay? And so, and it's, it's run, it was run by the Baptists, and, and they were like, hey, we can do this, and they did, they opened their school next, okay? Remember, there's no magic. There's a logical order in the way that these uh, schools opened. And Leonard opened and operated, uh, uh, it's Leonard Medical School at Shaw University, okay? And Leonard opened and operated for many years, graduating many African Americans, and it was the first school in the country that we can document. The first, not black school, but the first school in the country that offered a four-year curriculum in medicine. And Leonard's graduates have gone on to do some, some very great things. But Leonard became a victim of the four Fs, okay? And that fourth deadly F was flexion, okay? Now, uh, those first schools, again, were opened by whites, religious organizations. Even General Howard had a nickname. Does anybody know General Howard's nickname? The Bible General. Huh. So having strong um, uh, religious uh, um, background was very, very important in going into medicine. And when you go down and you see our exhibits, you'll see an old pocket Bible um, because um, physicians, not just black, but physicians in general, had to have uh, uh, be a good moral character. Okay? It wasn't until the ninth black medical school really that opened in this country that uh, it became a, a black owned medical school. The first black owned and operated medical school in this country was the first school we visited, and that was Louisville National Medical College. And it was opened by a gentleman by the name of Henry Fitz Butler. Okay? And we start talking about the black proprietary medical schools, you will see them think about the time and period that they're opening. They're opening after the Civil War, 10, 20, you know, 30 years after the Civil War. So some of these guys who are opening these schools are coming out of, uh, uh, the, uh, out of being out of slavery, or their parents were uh, were slaves. Okay, so when uh, we talk about how hard things are today, imagine how hard things were for these guys, and they have the strength and fortitude to move forward, not only to become physicians, but to open their own medical schools and successfully graduate people who pass the national boards that everybody else passes. Now we struggle, but I, 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 let, me, let me clarify that. We struggle a lot on passing the national boards that everybody else passed, okay? But we still passed, okay? And these guys who opened these schools, and the schools are listed in here, that's why I'm beginning uh, the Evelyn Woods the speed version of the time. Open these schools, they not only became doctors, but nine times out of ten, they were more than just doctors. Henry Fitz Butler, for example, he also ran a newspaper. Okay, so you're a doctor, you're a founder of medical school, and you run a newspaper. And things got so hard that people still weren't being seen, even though now we're producing doctors, and now we have to go and open our own hospital. They opened a the hospital next door to the medical school because blacks couldn't be admitted to the, the charity hospital. Okay, so we have these stories. Um, Dr. Mazzuro mentioned um, the, the founding of the National Medical Association. In 1900, there was two schools started. There was the one that you just talked about, Christ Institute, but there was another school, the University of West Tennessee. It was started by a, a gentleman by the name of Miles Lynx, Dr. Miles Lynx. Dr. Miles Lynx also ran a newspaper. He uh, founded the first black medical journal in this country. 
And there's a sample of it in the, in the book there. I hope we put that in there. Um, but it's definitely on the exhibit downstairs, okay? And Dr. Miles Lynx, one of the founders of the National Medical Association, he wasn't a founding officer, but it was his thoughts that went into developing the National Medical Association. Um, the, there's a gentleman, and I'm sorry, Demetrius didn't mention him, and kind of blocking on his name, the, the first president of the National Medical Association out of Central, out of um, Meharry. But that 1995 year becomes very, very uh, significant in the history of the Black Medical Association and Black doctors in the city. The AMA, the AMA is a very interesting organization, okay? The AMA uh, did not take a stand against Blacks joining. But what the AMA did was, they said that the only way you could become an a, a member of the AMA if you were a member of your local medical society. No local medical society would admit Blacks. So through default, there were no Blacks in the AMA. And through constant efforts of trying and trying to join the AMA, Miles Lynx decided we need to get our own. And at that convention in, in uh, 1895, that's when a group of black doctors, pharmacists, nurses, new set social workers, you know, got together and they got their own. They started the National Medical Association. That's what that was fine. So you have, I mentioned the first one, the Alpha, uh, the Louisville National Medical College. And I mentioned the Omega, the last one to come in, Western uh, Tennessee, West Tennessee uh, College of, of uh, Medicine and Surgery, okay? And then the schools uh, between them, the black owned and operated schools between them. When those schools were operating, most of the schools operated and tried to do the best job and be as competitive as possible. A few schools opened just like, a few black schools opened just like some white schools opened where it was not the best, the, the intent would not necessarily was to create a, a, a group of doctors, uh, fine doctors to practice medicine. Um, they called some of these schools diploma meals. You know, you sign in, sign out. And that was one of the DJ schools that he was going to talk to you about. Hannibal is uh, the example of a school that's supposed to have been a diploma meal. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm biased. I try to get everybody, particularly the black owned schools, the, you know, a, a pass. But even some of the, the black schools at that time did not support Hannibal. So Hannibal was in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. And um, DJ didn't mention, but Tennessee is, is his uh, uh, schools because he was born in Tennessee. There's no magic. That's right. uh, he's our Tennessee guy. But uh, Hannibal uh, uh, is another school. Noble mentioned uh, Wilp Wilberforce, AMA, uh, Delaney. Okay. There is no magic. Another school that's not uh, well represented in the history books is uh, called um, Southwest University School of Medicine uh, Bethel Institute. Okay, that school is said not to exist. We found no charter for that school, and it's supposed to exist in, in in Arkansas. And so, because there's no charter, that's the way the history books have been written. But what we found that nobody else seemed to have noticed, we found the date the school closed. You can't close if you never open, <laughs> okay? So there were a couple of graduates who claimed to have went to that school. One of them was the founder of Hannibal. And because they couldn't document that that school existed, that was another nail in the coffin of Hannibal being a diploma deal, okay? But we found that school closed, and the dates that the school closed coincides to the dates that this gentleman who founded Hannibal said he attended. So now we're trying to close that loop as part of our research to try to help uh, Mr. Contrail out. And we've helped him in a couple of ways. We found his brother, information on his brother, who attended Central Michigan, Central Michigan, Central Tennessee uh, University at the same time as one of the board members of Hannibal attended. And he was a lawyer. So it doesn't make sense to us 
that a person would go to Central Tennessee, which is very well respected as a black school, okay? The one that becomes Meharry. Go to Central Tennessee, be a lawyer, go and get on the board of trustees of, of Hannibal, if Hannibal is a, is a um, diploma mill being run by a doctor who's not really a doctor. And the gentleman who's on the board graduated from Central Tennessee at the same time that um, Contrell, who founded Hannibal, his brother graduated. So they know each other. So why would you risk that in that time, pretending to be on the board or something that didn't exist? So there's some circumstances stuff that's, that's driving us to go back and do some more research to help uh, help a brother out. <laughs> so there's stories about all these uh, different schools. There's information about all these different schools. We touched upon this. The, the, the Bethel piece, um, Wilberforce, in 1863, uh, Wilberforce was, was uh, um, purchased by the group of the, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. One of the founding people was a gentleman by the name of Bishop Shorter in 1863. In 1868, Howard opens. And remember, Howard is not going to ask the question, get advice from Wilberforce. In 1868, Shorter, who was one of the founders, the black founders of Wilberforce, is sent to Arkansas. He sent to Little Rock, Arkansas. He sent there to start churches and to start schools. He gets there. Now remember, he's he's in Philadelphia, he's in Pennsylvania at the time when Howard is trying to find information about how to start black schools, medical schools. Okay, so he's coming there with that knowledge. There's no link between, well. Bethel Institute is started a few years later. Bethel Institute's name is changed to Shorter College because of all the work that Shorter has done. Just imagine, and I, have, I can't prove this, but just imagine Shorter's coming to uh, Arkansas, starting schools, and he's just walked away from them seeing them start medical schools out of nothing back on, uh, on the East Coast. He has whatever knowledge that they have, and he says, why don't we do a medical school here too? His timeline coincides with Contrell, the guy who says he graduated from a non-existing medical school called Southwest. Uh, um, I tell you what, it's in here, Southwest. Yeah, that Southwest. Yeah, Southwestern University. Okay, at Bethel Institute. Bethel Institute is renamed short. It's a circle that keeps spinning around. You know, there's dots that you know are connected, the timeline connects. And once we connect that timeline, and once we connect those dots, we'll be able to help Contrell not be a quack, you know, lying about a degree, but actually what he says is true. But it's all circumstantial now. And again, that's our findings. So go down and take a look at the exhibit. Um, there's uh, other schools. Uh, we didn't talk about the grave robbers and all that good stuff. but. Uh, <laughs> Um, we appreciate you inviting us to come and, and chat with you. We love to talk about this topic. We'll stay all night. At, no, throw me out and ask, you know, to answer questions. So please, uh, if you have some questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Is there any questions for uh, Ms. Moncrease or Dr. Moncrease? I know uh, it's three o'clock now. We're going to. We're going. It's almost three thirty. It's almost three thirty. Yeah. Okay. Can we go downstairs? Yeah, we can go downstairs yeah, and then we'll. Then we'll return and uh, we can have a Q&A and informal uh, discussion with some light refreshment here. All right, so we, please join me in uh, expressing our appreciation.